Hey guys, this is John. All right, welcome to another episode of The Archives. Let's do this. So in The Archives, I'm going through games that I played in my tournament experience over the past roughly 20 years. I've been playing tournament chess since I think 1998, and I have a ton of score sheets that have just been sitting in my closet collecting dust. So I thought I'd share these with you guys. And hopefully I can highlight things that I've done correctly along the way, and also things maybe I could have improved upon in my journey to where I'm at now, which is International Master. So last time we had a look at a game, which was I think my 11th USCF rated game ever. And it was played in April 1999. We're fast forwarding only a month. So the game we're gonna look at today was played in this tournament, the National Elementary Championship in Phoenix, Arizona, 1999. And I was rated 1200 at this time. So my rating as a result of that good tournament I had at the National High School Tournament, I was playing up in the National High School Tournament, had a good tournament there, gained a bunch of rating points, and now we're at the National Elementary, where I'm playing players my own age. And this particular game caught my eye because for a couple reasons. First reason was I know the player that I played in this game, and I still kind of keep in touch with him. We're friends on Facebook. His name is Josh Weinstein, and he recently became a USCF master. So I wanted to say congratulations to Josh. And the other reason I wanted to show this game is because I actually faced the Scandi. This is probably my earliest Scandi game, at least that I can find. I did not play the Scandi, but I faced it. So I was white in this game, you're seeing it from my perspective, and Josh was black. Josh was rated 1423 at this time, compared to my 1200 rating. So I'm outgunned in this one, but I do have the white pieces. I have not reviewed this game yet, so let's see what happens. So I opened with E4. And he played d5, as I already alluded to. I took the pawn. And now Josh played knight f6. Okay, so he does not play queen takes d5, as I'm accustomed to playing. He plays the riskier, sometimes gambit variation with knight f6, where black offers white a chance to guard the pawn with a move like c4. But if white does play c4, black has good options with either c6 or e6, which is the so-called Icelandic gambit. I would not recommend this move if I were white. So how did I combat this? I played d4. Okay, so I had the sense not to defend that pawn, or at least not to doggedly try to defend that pawn. I'm just giving him a chance to take it back, which he did. He played queen takes d5. And here I played knight c3. Okay, so looking at this position with fresh eyes, I think given that black has played queen takes d5, white should play c4. It would be good to play c4, because in the white side of the Scandinavian, if you can establish two pawns on d4, c4, side to side, that's usually something of a victory. Especially if you can maintain those pawns, and black isn't getting like all this counterplay against them. You know, if you compare it to, if we just go back to the beginning, e4, d5, e takes d5, queen takes d5. Part of the reason why people like playing the Scandinavian for black, in my opinion, is that after knight c3, white's own knight is blocking the c-pawn. And I know knight c3 is an incredibly common move. It's a good move. It gains a tempo attacking the queen, bringing a piece out. How can it be bad? But the slight downside is that it does block the c-pawn. So that makes me think in this version that we got in the game, given that he took with the queen rather than taking with the knight, which is, I think, more often played there, or sometimes black even plays this move, bishop g4. This is the, the Portuguese variation. Um, I think I should have played, after queen takes, this move c4 and take in the center, and then try to follow up with knight c3 after that. Let's just say black puts the queen back, knight c3. This is a better formation for white than having the pawn back on c2. White has more central control, like look at the control of the d5 square. Uh, they're controlling that square twice as well, with two pieces. And same thing could happen, by the way, if black does take with the knight on d5. Like, white could definitely still play c4 here, if he wanted. So... After queen takes d5, though, I played that knight c3 move. And now Josh played queen a5. Yeah, so he just brings his queen to the side of the board. Now we've actually transposed to a position from the queen takes d5 Scandinavian. And here I played bishop d3. Hmm. And I have something crossed out. It looks like I wrote down bishop f4 originally. So maybe I was thinking of playing this move. But instead, I went with this one. So that indicates to me I was already out of book at this time. <laughs> I probably hadn't faced the Scandinavian at all, definitely not in a tournament game, but 
even in practice, I probably hadn't faced it, so I was just winging it at this point. So bishop d3 is not a terrible move, but bishop c4 or knight f3 are going to be a bit more promising for white. Those are the standard theoretical moves. So bishop d3, and Josh plays bishop g4, aggressive. So attacking my queen with tempo, maybe trying to bait me into playing f3, hitting the bishop. But I responded with knight g2, okay? Hmm. So I didn't put the knight on f3 to break the pin. I put it here. Maybe I wanted to retain the option of playing f3. That's my best guess. So knight g e2 looks reasonable. Now he played knight c6. Another aggressive move. So with this move, Josh is threatening knight takes c6, uh, knight takes d4 rather. I could not take back with my knight because then I would lose my queen on d1. So how did I deal with that? I played f3, so now I do kick the bishop. And he plays bishop h5. Okay, so he just drops it back. And now here I decided to castle short. Yeah, it seems normal. So escaping the pin on the c3 knight, just getting my king to safety. Just seeing if there's any other options that spring to mind here. I mean, I could try to chase the bishop like g4, but maybe I don't want to weaken my king side. I think castling looks normal. Bishop d2 also comes to mind. Because with the knight on c6 blocking the black pawn from coming up to c6, sometimes this queen has difficulty finding a decent square to retreat. You know, if black had this formation instead, the queen could always drop back to c7 or d8 pretty easily. You guys have seen me do this from the black side of the Scandinavian many times. But with the knight on c6, black has to take more care because this queen is subject to attack. You know, moves like knight b5 might be gaining in strength. I don't think bishop d2 is, you know, leading to a clear edge for white or anything, but it does look like a, a decent alternative. So I castle, and Josh plays bishop g6. Okay, so he moves the bishop again. Evidently, he wants to offer a trade of the light square bishops, and I bet I was hesitant to take him up on that, because if I do trade, he can take with the h-pawn and try to attack down the h-file, hit that pawn on h2. Yeah, so after bishop g6, which does move a piece twice, I mean, black is underdeveloped now. I wonder how I should proceed. I'm looking at stuff in the center here, like trying to get in d5, or again, bishop d2, but I guess bishop d2, he might take, and then I have to mess up my pawns, don't I? Because I've just interfered with my queen being able to recapture the bishop. This is an ugly situation for white if I had to do that. So... What to play here? And I could bring the bishop elsewhere. I could develop the dark square bishop to like f4, let's say. I mean, taking is probably not the end of the world either. I mean, black will take this way, but it's not that big of a deal, I don't think. d5 is also interesting. Like, still, I'm thinking about this move. And then after knight takes d5, like, one point would be to play bishop takes g6 now with a double attack on the knight on d5. In a black were to reply, let's say knight takes c3, using an in-between move, white can play bishop takes f7 check. King takes f7, and now just recapture, so knight takes c3. And after that transaction, it's material equality, but I've managed to disturb black's king. It's out in the open. This looks clearly better for white. So perhaps d5 should be considered in that position. So if we go back to this one, pushing in the center d5. And if this knight moves, let's say like knight e5, then maybe bishop b5 check is an option. Again, trying to disturb black's king. So what did I play? I played knight e4. Hmm, okay. So I blocked the, the potential trade of bishops. I also enable this pawn to come up to c3 if I ever need to support my center. Looks okay. I don't think nowadays I would play this move, but I can see why I did it. And here Josh castled, so he castles queen side. Gets his king to safety, attacks this pawn. And I must have had that c3 idea in mind when I played knight e4, because this is what I did now, so c3. This is helpful because it could be a prelude to a queenside attack as well. C3 not only props up d4, but it could help me play b4. 
and get these pawns rolling on this side of the board. So now Josh played knight takes e4. And here again, I can see a moment of indecision because I crossed some stuff out on my score sheet. Originally, I had bishop takes e4, but I took with a pawn instead. f takes e4. All right. Hmm. So I, I must have felt that the bishops should be kept on the board. So if bishop takes e4 instead, can black use the d-file pressure somehow? I mean, you start to look at moves like e5, attacking the pawn on d4 a few times, but I'm not sure I want to allow this. Bishop takes c6. Bishop takes e4 actually looks okay for white. One nice point of that move might be that if the bishops do get traded, so take and take, here we can see my rook on f1 is attacking the pawn on f7. So that would require defense. I don't know. I don't know what persuaded me to finally take with the pawn instead of the, the bishop on e4. So pawn takes. And now Josh played e5. Okay, so attacking the d-pawn again. Lots of pressure on that guy. And I can either try to support it with a move like bishop e3, or I can push past. I think I have to address that pawn somehow. I don't really want to take, because if I take, that opens the black rook up against my bishop on d3. You know, I'm inviting stuff like this even. Bishop takes e4 using the pin. So I think my options are going to be pretty limited to supporting d4 or pushing past. And I did push past. I played d5. Josh played queen b6 check. Okay. Yeah, my king is exposed on this diagonal. I feel like this is a move that black might want to keep in his back pocket, though. I don't know that black should play this right away, because if you're sitting here as white, you know your king is exposed on this diagonal. It's almost a relief when your opponent plays this move, because they're nudging your king in the direction it wants to go anyways. So you can make an argument for black avoiding that move, postponing it until a better time, like maybe just move this knight away. Granted, this knight doesn't have a lot of good squares, though, does it? Like, b8 is pretty passive. e7 is going to block the bishop. So... Let's see what he does after queen b6, because I did play king h1, and he plays knight b8. All right, so at this point, we're 13 moves into the game. The castling situation has been determined. Opposite side castling, that usually indicates it's going to be a fight. Typically, you see pawn storms and mutual attacks against the king, the kings, plural, in these cases. So will I go for that, or will I do something else? I played... A4. All right, so I must have been thinking pawn storm. A4, trying to gain a tempo on the black queen with A5. That looks logical. And now Josh plays C6. So giving the queen room to come back here to C7 and also attacking D5. Yeah, that's, that's decent thinking, I believe, because I think I'd still be hesitant to ever take this pawn. You know, with bishop takes E4 still lurking, I don't think I want to capture here. You know, this might also allow his knight to come out. I mean, as black, you kind of hate to play a pawn move on the side of the board where you're getting attacked. Usually you want to try to avoid stuff like that. But I think his queen is feeling the heat on b6, as I alluded to earlier. So, okay, c6. And I supported the pawn with c4. a5 also seems to make a good deal of sense. Just advance and attack the queen, gain a tempo. But I preferred c4. And he voluntarily dropped the queen back, queen c7. I played bishop e3. So get that final minor piece into the game, bishop e3. I like my position right here. As white, I'm, I'm completely happy, I think. It just looks like white's pawn storm is proceeding quickly, and black has not got anything going against my king over here. My pawn wedge in the center looks pretty strong. Yeah, I can continue with a5, possibly bring up the b-pawn later. I even have pressure against f7. I know black's bishop is guarding that for the moment. But white's position looks freer, and I have more space, too. So I'd say I have an advantage at this point. So bishop e3, Josh plays knight a6. Okay. Bringing the knight back into the game. Probably trying to eye the c5 and the b4 squares. Yeah. Since I have established pawns on light squares here, my dark squares are kind of weak, these two. Like, if he were to plop this knight on b4, I can't chase that with one of my pawns because they've already advanced up here. 
Also, he might be thinking about bishop c5, trying to offer a trade of bishops with the help of the knight defending. I guess one question is, can I take this pawn on a7? This pawn is hanging. We always look at undefended stuff in a position. But those of you who have seen the game, the very famous game, Spassky versus Fisher from their 1972 match, I think the second game of the match, will know that this is often a poison pawn, a rook pawn captured by a bishop like this, because you're just asking for the bishop to be trapped. b6, and queen takes a7 is a threat that I think white has no recourse against, other than giving up the bishop for the pawn on b6 and only getting two pawns for the piece. So, while tempting, bishop takes a7 can backfire on white for that reason. You know, knight a6 might not be a bad move. I like that move by him. He's trying to kind of sink his pieces into the squares that I've already weakened, that I left behind by pushing my pawns up like this. I still like my position, but yeah, this is a good move. So knight a6, I played a5, so I just forge ahead. And he does play bishop c5. Okay. Offering a trade of the bishops. I do take him up on that, so I swap. I wonder if I can let him come to me with the trade. I wonder if a move like queen d2 or queen c1 is appropriate. So trying to let black initiate it. That way, if take and take, I get my queen active, my rooks are connected, and now queen takes a7 could be a threat. You know, queen is not going to get trapped like a bishop does with black playing b6. So also I have my pawn up on a5 even. So this is a attractive way to maybe try to get a trade going on my own terms. You guys might have heard that that famous saying, to take is a mistake, which kind of alludes to this principle that you want to try to uh, bring about favorable trades whenever possible. So yeah, like queen d2 or queen c1 could be a way for white to do that. If I sense that black really wants to take on e3, this could be a, a strong idea. Another thing is queen c1 doesn't connect the rooks, and queen d2, while being the more natural move, does pose the question as to whether black can play bishop b4. Attacking the queen and the a5 pawn. And after the queen moves, just scoop this guy. And it is a pawn. I know it's a pawn on the side of the board where white's attacking, but it's a pawn nonetheless. So I think if I were to move a queen to some square, I think queen c1 is probably the square to go to. And then it's a question of, does black have something better than bishop takes e3? And I can think of other moves black can play here, but that's one of the more obvious ones. Maybe black could go here, knight b4. Abandoning the bishop, but if takes, there's knight takes d3 with the attack on the queen and the bishop. I guess I could play queen e3 even in this case, but I'm not sure I want to trade that many pieces. Hmm. Okay, so going back... I did initiate the trade, so bishop takes c5, knight takes c5. Now another move that I crossed out, looks like I had b4 originally, but I must have crossed out because I realized it drops a pawn. Yeah, b4, knight takes e4 does not look like a good idea for black. That seems to just drop a straight pawn. So what did I do about this hanging pawn on e4? I played queen c2. Okay, so I just reinforce. Black's knight is kind of holding my bishop hostage now. It can just capture it whenever it likes, but at least I'm not losing the pawn. So queen c2, and he calmly played king b8, so just tucking his king away. Yeah, maybe he senses future problems down the c-file, just doesn't want his king anywhere near that action. So king b8, now I play knight c3. Okay, bringing the knight around. The knight wasn't doing a whole heck of a lot on e2, so I could see why I would like to reposition it. Also, b4 is begging to be played pretty soon, but yeah, I have no issue with knight c3. I don't think black can really stop b4, so it's coming pretty quick no matter what. So knight c3, he voluntarily takes. I take with the queen. And now f6. Okay. So it's interesting how this game is playing out. Um... I'm attacking on the queen side. I haven't gone all out in the attack. I'm actually kind of carefully preparing it. And he really hasn't done anything on the king side. I mentioned that with opposite side castling, you see mutual attacks and often mutual pawn storms. But 
so far, black has just been responding to my threats on the queen side and playing very solid. I mean, a lot of these moves he's making, he's kind of battening down the hatches. You know, king b8, knight a6, bishop c5, f6, solidifying the pawn structure here. No weakness on f7 to worry about. I can see why Josh was the higher rated player. Uh, he's playing some moves that come with experience, I think, even though, you know, 1423 is a decent rating. It's not like a, a hugely high rating, but um, he's showing some nice sophistication here and knowledge of, of how to defend himself in the face of an attack. So f6, I charge ahead with b4. And now he plays a6. Hmm. Just as I was praising his defensive skills, <laughs> I don't know about this move. I posed this rule and this principle to you guys before in videos, but I'm of the opinion that if you're getting attacked on one side of the board, it's okay to make one pawn move, but when you start making two pawn moves or more, that's when bad stuff can happen to your position. So with a6, I know he's trying to influence the b5 square, but if I do get b5 in favorably, it creates two contact points as opposed to just a single contact point if the pawn is on c6, whereupon maybe in some cases he can even play c5 and lock it up. So I'm a little skeptical of a6. This move seems a bit nervy. But what else can black do? I mean, black is cramped. I mean, maybe he can play a move like h5 to try to get something going over here. But, again, he's not really thinking offensive right now. He's probably best off not taking this pawn. I mean, I think he's avoiding the capture on d5 for a reason, because if he does take, I can take with my knight, and I get to establish a fairly dominating piece in the center. Although, technically, I'm not threatening knight takes c7 here due to my own queen hanging. So, maybe he could even bring this bishop back and try to take here if he likes. But I suspect that was the reason why he wasn't chomping at the bit to make this exchange on d5. So a6, and now I played rook fb1. So I swing this guy over. Yeah, no doubt what I'm going for at this point. I think I'm gearing up completely for the b5 pawn push. And I probably use this rook because if I were to use this one and then I played b5, this pawn could be loose on a5. I don't know how big of a deal that is, given that, you know, we, we typically don't mind losing a pawn on the side of the board where we're attacking. But rook b one seems consistent. I've got all my resources on the side of the board where I'm assaulting my opponent's king. So rook fb1. Lost my place in the game here. Bishop e8. Wow. Super defensive. So... He's adding more support to the b5 square with that move. Like, he's anticipating that I'm going to push here. Now the bishop is at least helping out. And I did not push, even in this position. I played queen e3. So repositioning my queen. Hmm. If I do push, I wonder what I was worried about. So let's say, hypothetically, I play b5. Let's say black takes with a c pawn. Because again, with two contact points, there's going to be a clash here. Black cannot help but open the position. Like now playing c5 is just ineffective. I can take here, there's a pin on the b7 pawn. So lines are gonna get opened up. So let's say c takes b5, c takes b5. Again, this is a threat. This could be a threat sometimes, especially if the king goes to a7. So probably black has to take it again, take. And now if I play simply knight takes, I think I have a pretty good position. Knight takes. I assume he takes with the bishop, I take with the queen, and I know there's been some trades and equal trades, but a6 is coming, the attack on b7, and black is looking hard up for a defense here. This is not a fun position to hold for him. I mean, maybe king a7, so that if a6 he can play b6, but ugh, this is pretty disgusting for black. Let's say rook here, attack the queen. My next move might be rook into c6. Notice the effect that this pawn has on d5. It's a really nice anchor for a rook coming in. b6 is still weak. I've also got this rook I can send to b1 or c1. I don't think black can hold this position. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I should have hesitated with b5. I think I'm completely primed to play that move. 
and I maybe should have just pulled the trigger right there. This is sometimes the effect of playing a higher rated player though. You, you tend to doubt yourself. In moves that you might have played against a lower rated player, you, uh, you second guess and you may not ultimately play against that higher rated opponent. But b5, I mean, I'm completely geared up for this move. I've got my queen, my knight, my rook, all protecting this pawn. The other pawn's also protecting. My rook is aligned with his king. I don't know what I was worried about. All I see are just a bunch of trades. You know, all these pawns get swapped. You know, knight takes, queen takes, even rook takes is probably good here if I want to take that way and try to double up the rooks. And this pawn is just such a huge target, as is black's king. Hmm. Be bold, John. Be bold, 12-year-old John. All right, so what did I play now? I played queen e3. It's funny, like, telling myself to be bold, because I could totally see myself now as a chess coach reviewing a game of a student and asking them, so, asking them like, you know, why didn't you play b5? You got to go for it, man. <laughs> this is your chance. So definitely should have played that move. Queen e3. I must have just been afraid of some pressure down the D file, or maybe I was trying to prepare B5 under better circumstances. But now Josh takes, so C takes D5, opening up the, the queen on the C file. Yeah, and if I jump in with the knight, I would be losing that C pawn. That's an important development. Knight takes D5, queen takes C4. And I don't think the queen gets trapped or anything. Rook C1, queen here. Rook C5, maybe queen back here. Probably white has good play even in this case, rook c7, queen d6, but not an immediate win. That other line was better. Hmm. So after the capture on d5, which way did I recapture? I took with a c pawn, so c takes d5. Now he infiltrated, queen c4. And b5 is going to be more difficult to execute now because black has one, two three defenders on that square, and I only have the knight and the rook supporting the pawn push now, as I vacated that diagonal with my queen. Also, my queen now has to stay monitoring the knight. So queen c4, I played queen g3, another crossed out move. I had knight e2 originally, and rejected it, going backwards. Queen g3, I'm not sure what I'm going for, because as I just mentioned, the queen does have to stay guarding the knight, so this maybe could be a threat because, yeah, the rook would be undefended over here. But this seems to me like kind of a ticky-tack threat. And it's the direction that I'm not even focusing my attack. I was attacking exclusively on the queen side, then all of a sudden I play this queen move to the other side of the board. It just looks a little disjointed. Sometimes you may shift targets like that in a game, but I think that was more born out of confusion than some sort of grand attacking plan. So queen g3, he plays bishop g6, blocking queen takes g7, connecting the rooks, also pressuring e4. I play the queen back to e3. Yeah, that's a clear sign that I'm confused. Mm -hmm. I can almost <laughs> see the, uh, the gears trying to turn in my head and just not coming up with a good plan. Even though this game was played like 17 years ago. Yeah, queen back to e3. Maybe hoping that he repeats, but now Black probably doesn't have any uh, motivation to repeat the position. He might be thinking that he has me on the defensive and that I'm confused. So he played queen d4. Good move. Yeah, centralize the queen and offer a trade. Because if I take him up on this trade, queen takes d4, pawn takes d4. The knight is under attack. And if the knight moves away, I lose this guy. And if I lose e4, I'm going to lose d5 as well. This d-pawn is suddenly a monster. Uh, yeah, Rome is burning here. My once proud position is rubble. Yikes. Okay, so I can't trade queens, and he's just played a powerful centralizing move. So I play queen to e1 with my tail in between my legs. Okay, queen e1. Now he goes rook c8. Mm-hmm. Excellent use of the open file. Yeah, attacking my knight. And I defended the knight, rook a3. I probably didn't want to move it away, again, because I lose this guy on e4. And if this were to happen, I think I'd basically have to go for broke with a move like b5 and hope for the best, but I missed that chance a long time ago. So rook a3, 
Josh played rook c4, very efficient, attacking this guy, encouraging b5, but now he's ready to bring this other rook over. So this rook that has, up till this point, just been sitting in the corner, it may now join the attack on my knight on c3. So he's targeting this knight because he knows that this knight leads to the e-pawn, and if he wins the e-pawn, the position is going to turn in black's favor very quick. So I played b5, and now he just took. Okay. So he doesn't mind that I can take with my knight or my, my rook. He's calculated that it's fine for him in both cases. I did take with the knight, but unfortunately, upon taking with the knight, I do lose that pawn, as I was saying. I wonder if rook takes was better. So rook takes b5. I guess black continues with this move. Yeah, and that knight is really the cause of all my problems here. If I try to go for broke and play rook a to b3, attacking b7, I think he can just take here. Rook takes b7, king a8, blacks up a bishop, and he's pretty safe. Yeah, I don't see any tricks I have. I need my queen on e2 or f1 so I can play queen a6 and mate him, but that's not going to happen. Meanwhile, he's threatening rook c1. I've got back rank issues, my own problems with my king. Hmm. So, again, going back for a second... So knight takes b5 was played, but I'm going to lose e4, so queen takes e4. Maybe I was intending to play a move like queen f2 or queen g1 to try to set up queen a7 checkmate, but I don't have time because he would take on b1 in that case. And I can't move the queen from the back rank, I'd be in check myself. So I had to swap the queens off, queen takes e4. Bishop takes e4. Now d5 is threatened. I'm down a pawn, and also rook c1 is threatened. That's the biggest threat in the position. Oh, yeah, and it looks like I blundered the game away at this point. Wait, is that right? Rook d... It says I played knight d6 here. Knight d6 trying to fork the rook and the bishop, but that would just lose to this move. Maybe there's some time pressure going on because... Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. We gotta go back for a second. <laughs> this sometimes happens when you're reviewing a game from a score sheet. You forget where pieces, certain pieces are. So my rook is still over here. So that's important to note. Or uh, I should say his rook is still over here. So right in this position, when knight takes b5 was played, yeah, this rook has not reached c8 yet. So knight takes b5, queen takes e4. Even still, I have to trade the queens because bishop queen takes b1 is still too strong of a threat. So take, bishop takes, and that explains knight d6. Yeah, I would not play that move if the rook was already on c8 due to rook c1. So knight d6, but he took here. Bishop takes b1, knight takes c4. Aha, uh -huh, and now he played the rook over. Rook to c8. Ouch. Yeah, and that back rank issue still comes back to bite me. If the knight moves, just rook down to c1. So I played rook c3, but black to play and win here. Bishop a2 takes care of, of uh, the task. Attack the pin piece. And I resigned at this point. Move 35. Resignation. Yeah, just nothing to do. I'm losing that knight. If I play the d-pawn forward, I think he can just take with the rook. And if ever d7 is played, just king c7, he easily stops the d-pawn, lights out. So, just thinking back about that game, I like the way I handled the opening. You know, as I said, I probably didn't have much experience playing against the Scandinavian, if at all. And we got into that opposite side castling position where my attack on the queen side seemed to be faster than anything he was doing elsewhere. I mean, you can see he never attacked me on the king side. He never pushed these pawns. He pretty much just played defense. And that moment where I hesitated with b5, let me just set that back up for a second, because that was just such a crucial position. And for those of you watching this video and maybe see some uh, comparison to your own play in the sense that you hesitate at certain moments, you can appreciate what I did here.
for what I failed to do. And this bishop was on e8. So I think this is the exact position. Yeah, I was all geared up for b5, and I just didn't do it. For some reason, I got cold feet about it. Maybe I decided I didn't want my queen lined up with his rook. But I would be willing to bet if b5 was played right here, black is very hard-pressed to defend. Because as we explored, even all those trades don't completely stop the attack against white's, against black's king. On the contrary, white's attack is still very strong, even with queen and two rooks on the board against queen and two rooks. Black's king is just a, a permanent target. But I played queen e3, and black started wriggling free. That's where you could really see the rating difference. So if you've been building up an attack on one side of the board and you know you get into a position where you think it's time to pull the trigger, don't hesitate because you might not get another chance in chess. I know that's a huge generalization and you can find exceptions, but I've had strong players tell me this before too, that you know a lot of times you only get one chance in a position and if you don't make the most of it, the advantage can easily swing in your opponent's favor. That initiative can just vanish in an instant and you're going to be uh, regretting the fact that you didn't go for the throat when you could have. Okay, this turned out to be a very interesting game. I like this a lot. Uh, so good game, Josh. <laughs> you got me on this day, uh, May, I think it must have been May 14th or 15th, 1999. I'm going to post this on your Facebook wall, by the way. And also, I wanted to thank you guys, the viewers. Last time I was asking for uh, potential names for this series, because I thought the archives sounded a little bland. And I think I will stick with the archives, but you guys gave some really good suggestions. You were saying stuff like, uh, the Scandi Files. Uh, one suggestion that I thought was really good was climbing my rating ladder. I would consider changing that, although I already have a couple series with rating ladder in the name. So um, I'm going to stick with the archives. I'm not going to do a passage through John, as one user suggestion, suggested. Yeah, a passage through John, I think, is a little too descriptive. <laughs> so thank you for that, though, in any case. Anyways, if you guys have any questions or comments about this game, please let me know and I'll try to make another game from the archives very soon. All right, bye guys.